This is a Heart and Hand production. Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Adam Thornton and you're listening to Tactics Talk. Joining me as usual for the show is Ali Bain. Ali, how are you getting on? Good, thanks mate. Glad to be on. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here as well. Another week down and another win for Rangers, the 2-0 victory against Kilmarnock uh, at the weekend. Um, we will talk about the, the game uh, as we go through, um, but we're going to kind of finish off last week's discussion um, and round out the, the rest of the attacking roles. So so last week we did the uh, midfield show um, and we talked about the, the roles that you get in midfield, 6, 8, 10, etc. And, and players that play those, how that correlates to Rangers and all that sort of stuff. And the feedback was really good, so thank you. Um, so we're going to do that again tonight, but we're going to look at the, the attacking roles. Um, we covered number 10 last week, so although number 10 can kind of flip between both, we're going to miss that out this week. Um, and we're just going to go for, I guess, 7, 9 and 11, if you want to call it the, the actual uh, number of names. So um, we're going to use Tactical Pad again for this, so you can see what we mean on the screen. This will also be available on YouTube again, so tune in there if you want to see the wee Subutio men kicking the wee balls about. Um, Ali, let's kick off then with the, the big one, I guess, the number 9 position. Um, like I said, we covered number 10 last week, but... A nine is probably up there again in terms of being one of the most well-known of those number-based positions. Mm-hmm. Um, name is a, a cla- what you would class as a classic Rangers number nine, um, and then what do you think that role entails? Okay, so before we get into this one, I meant to bring this up last week, actually, which I think could be a, a good little talking point, would be any of the guys or girls that listen to the show they play football manager. Um, the names or the nomenclature they use is um, is a good sort of place to start. Obviously, that in terms of positional um, variations and the in the roles, obviously they give them sort of fancy names, right? Because they they got to call it something. Um, you wouldn't ever hear a football manager calling someone an enganch or a hmm. you know shadow striker or whatever. But if you look at the details of what they do, then now you can start to see how that sort of filters in. Um, so classic number nine, obviously in British football anyway, the I guess the centre of the penalty box is typically where that player is lived, right? Obviously there's different football cultures, there's different um, football styles, but for a lot of British football, it was essentially built from the forward line. So what type of striker are we going with? Again, typically it's a penalty box forward. So obviously, let's say you know McCoy's being the, the sort of prime example of that. And then working back the way from, okay, how are we going to get him the ball as it crosses from wide areas? Are we going to have a, a you know a target man flick the ball onto him? Are we going to have uh, maybe a runner off him that can get past him uh, and break the back line for little crosses into the box or cutbacks or square balls? So really that, that central player is we regard uh, the traditional number nine, effectively someone that's the, the cherry on top, if you like, the guy who's there. Essentially, just to finish off chances. So, basically, the, the penalty box thing, I guess. Um, for me, I suppose the most obvious uh, number nine for Rangers is McCoyst, really. Mm. Um, it, it's funny, when, when McCoyst was the number nine, I guess you probably don't really think of, of tactics, etc. all that much, right? It, it wasn't, you weren't, it was just big man, little man, really, wasn't it? You weren't necessarily right. aware of. Um, the characteristics of a role that McCoy would play. Um, so it's, it's it's interesting. It was more player based back then. I think um, for for that kind of role. What about um, modern football as a whole? Then um, there's a real lack of them at the minute. I think it's fair to say. Um, at the time of recording, which is Monday night, we probably saw the the best in the business at the minute uh, in last night's Champions League final and, and Robert Lewandowski. What do you think is has caused this? Because obviously teams are scoring more and more goals, but for whatever reason, um, number nines um, out with a, a couple of obvious ones seem quite hard to come by. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'll draw a couple of lines right on the board first, and I'll explain why I'm doing it in a second. So if we were to divide the 18-yard box right into 
thirds, right? So obviously the size of the 18 yard box and then the central zone. The central zone, um, in sort of coaching terms or analysis terms, is what they call the golden zone. So obviously the amount of entries you can get in there, however your forward plays, is um, is the most important thing, right? It's highest probability, highest chance of scoring a goal is in that central part of the 18 yard box. Now, when we look at the number nine's role in building the game up, right? So again, traditionally, let's say our two forwards are left and right of each other in a, in a classic 4-4-2. There is as much chance of one player checking to the ball and one player then attacking the golden zone as, you know, as is statistically possible, right? One goes, one stays. Now with um, systems changing to a single forward, now really comes into the realms of, well, how are your wingers, right, or your outside forwards, or however you want to call them, going to be involved in build-up play um, in order to get the forward into the box, right? So if we if we figured that our number nine is just going to live in the box, well, now there's this massive gap in front of the centre-backs that we now can't build up through, right? So you have to go wide. So what a lot of teams, or certainly what a lot of managers wanted to prevent was um, passing the ball wide and then the opposition just shifting across and taking away that wide player's options, right? So again, if we figure this, a Ryan Giggs on the left wing, running down the sideline and crossing into one person, then in theory now that's that's not going to get us where we need to get to because we're playing with three midfield. So the, the variation that we saw was a number nine that would come and link with, a, again, a Ryan Giggs on the outside. And then the runs would come from a number 10 or a deeper line midfielder and then the opposite side winger attacking the box. Right, so a good example of this was probably one of United's best teams um, of, sort of the last decade was when Berbatov played this role where he wasn't what we'd sort of term as a false nine, but neither was he really a penalty box forward. He sort of lived between the two. And I think this is where we've started to uh, you know, really evolve the role is if you're a creative forward, right, the demands are that, yes, you're involved in build-up play, but you are still required to score, right? You're still paid to finish chances off. So, again, you mentioned Lewandowski there. You know, it's very much an all-rounder, Harry Kane as well, an all-rounder that can do a bit of everything very well, good in the air, can hold up play, can drop off and link. And again, I think that has been born out of, again, this necessity of we're going to need you when we've got the ball, um, but have you still got the athleticism to get in the box and, and finish chances for us? So, obviously, what you've kind of described there, like you mentioned, is that what you would class as, as classic Man U, really, in it, as, as Four sure. four two, mm-hmm. um, with uh, the the two wingers, whether it's, it's Giggs and Kajelskis or whatever, um, or, or you can go further up, further up the years when you've got Giggs again, but you've maybe got guys like Rooney playing wider or, or, or various things like that. So that I think number nine we, we can understand in, in that relationship with the the number ten, as you said, um, that's changed quite a bit as well, then hasn't it? Because we've had almost the the death of number tens a wee bit, um, mm-hmm. in the sense that. Every team you would play used to have one, really, for a for a period of time. But then, um, as the midfield battle becomes that bit more apparent, and you've other teams have got another player in there, the number ten has pushed back a little bit. And then, like you mentioned, that number nine um, has to do a little bit more. He simply can't just um, stay in between the posts and uh, occupy one or, or both defenders. He needs to turn into something else, and he needs to start dropping deep, etc. So that would be. Um, what you would class as the, the false nine then, um, which was obviously Leo Messi um, at Barcelona. Wasn't quite the first, I don't think, but certainly the one that, that kind of made it popular and, and took it more mainstream. Um, so that is, like you mentioned, kind of dropping off, etc. But then obviously you've got the challenge where um, he's dropping off and then we've got nobody in the box. So how do right. we combat that? Well, this is another one now, so again, I'll, I'll put some more lines on the on the field here real quick. So, again, running a line from, let's say, edge of the six-yard box, right? So we'll draw on it to the sideline. And you'll see this a lot on coaching fields now, especially with sort of wide forwards, is that they'll basically train games and they'll, oh, pardon me, they'll, um, they'll run matches in practice that don't allow the wingers to 
um, run to the end line like they traditionally would. I'll leave that there. Um, so essentially, what we're asking the wingers to do now is run inside and attack those central channels, right? So if the forward is going to drop off, and let's say the ball's coming from the fullback and the number nine's dropping in the midfield areas, is the wingers are now being asked, you cannot run wide on the outside of the fullback. You have to run inside. So again, class, I think classic Barcelona, the, you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Pedro making that inside run, David Villa running shoulders on the inside. And I think that the sort of next evolution to this is obviously something we're seeing a lot um, at Rangers right now, is the fullbacks now becoming the wingers, all right, or what we'd, you know, classically term as a winger, uh, and that has to now come from the movement of the forward. If if the forward doesn't link, doesn't pull the defence, doesn't open up gaps, then now that support plays sort of redundant, um, because if we've just got a guy who stands in between the two centre backs and we're asking our wingers to run in, now again you we create that quagmire we spoke about last week on the show. Um, and you've not got that same rotation, you've not got that same variation to your play. So I think the false nine was born really out of, for me, how do you get your best player on the ball? I think it really is as simple as that with Messi. I, I don't think there's this master grand plan that, that everyone sort of talks about with Guardiola. I, I think it, it really was, how can we get him in the middle? Maybe born as well with at the time. Um, Real Madrid were really aggressive in how they stepped and pressed the line high, right? So they figured, well, if that's going to be the case, they're going to press him hard. So that will naturally create avenues for our for our wingers to run inside. I think what's became harder, uh, and this is one of the reasons why you don't see Man City, you know, going back to Guardiola doing this with both wingers, is because of packed deep defences. You need someone stretching the play still. So you'll see Mares. Uh, on the right wing, whereas Sterling will cut in and, and on the far side. And then obviously you've got Aguero, which geez, even the evolution of him over the last uh, five years has been remarkable, signed purely as a, a sort of channels runner. If you like box, penalty box striker, now he's, again, he's in everything, right? Checks in, pops it off, can run a back post, wins headers. So, um, yeah, even in that false nine now, we've, we've saw an evolution in it. And that's the point about Messi, I guess, isn't it? Because when he was out on the wing, um, you need to, it's easy to remember that when that when he got moved, which was God, what twelve or thirteen years ago, just now, mm-hmm. I think from memory, the fullback behind him was what Abidal, probably. So right. not exactly a, a rampaging fullback that you see now. Therefore, there were situations where Messi would have two and three men on him out in that wing, and he's having to wriggle free and get into the middle, whereas mm-hmm. the, the whole point of it was bring him into the middle, like you said, where he can commit players and he can run at players from, from that zone and you get another forward out on the left side to stretch it. So again, bringing it back to, to Rangers then, at the time of recording, Alfredo Morelos is still a Rangers centre-forward. He's maybe not the Rangers centre-forward at the minute, but he's still right. a Rangers centre-forward. Um, we've mocked up here a good example of how Morelos played that false nine for Rangers in the opening day uh, against Aberdeen. So if you remember Ryan Kent's goal. Um, so Ali Tavernier starts with the ball. Um, as we see, number two there with the ball. You can see Morelos is um, deep. I mean, it's a, it's a ball in their own half, so he's, he's relatively deep. Normally, you would maybe expect them to be a little bit deeper. Aberdeen had pushed very high up for some reason, which is very unlike them. Um, and then Tavernier gets the ball, um, and he plays a direct pass. It kind of flicks past Hadji, is that right? It, it kind of... Yep. I don't know whether Hadji tries to get a touch on it, doesn't quite get a full one, um, and the ball falls to Morelos. Mm-hmm. And he then just takes a touch on it, brings the defenders into play, and then what you see is what we spoke about on the, the first pod of the, the season is that third man run then from, from mm-hmm. Kent, who runs on the blind side. Um, defenders don't track him. Um, Morelos plays that lovely ball through and then Kent has got a clear run into goal and score. So that, I guess, is an example of how the, the role has changed. You probably wouldn't um, see that very often um, in years gone by, but it's a good example of how you can use those... The wide player would be right on the wing, I guess, for, for a starter, so you probably wouldn't right. would see very much of that, but I guess how it shows how those roles have, have changed. It does, and I think this is a, a perfect system to do it against, right? Is uh, a man-for-man 
defended system that they want to get tight and get close to pretty much every player. So they force you to play a longer ball. And I think in this instance here, the, the player Kent ran off of is, you know, giving it the arm up, the offside. He's not, right? So obviously there's the breakdown there and now we're off to the races. I think that the important piece to this one, though, is is that when Morelis checks to the ball, right, is the timing of that movement. Because, again, if this is a ball over Morelis's head that Kent runs onto, that they, he'll be picked up, right, and the, the player would have probably dropped with him. But it's knowing that timing and movement. And, again, this is clearly something they've done in training, you know, four or five times. So even if it isn't Haji and he's sort of got a little flick on, it's a play they probably ran, right, a number of times to try and get that rotational movement. But it's like we've said, Morelis checking in off the high line, draws the centre half, pulls him higher, obviously exploits that space, but it's that diagonal run from Kent, which, again, I think this is just adding another layer to this um, to this lad's quality now. Is I think for me, when he first joined, he was very much a dribbler, right? It was somebody that wanted to get after it uh, 1v1, which I think, you know, he still is, right? He's still strong in those areas. But it was the timing of his movement and then obviously his finish as well. Fantastic, right? Obviously, from just I think it was just inside the box. Um, but again, pressure finish, took it well. It was a great goal overall, right? It was a lovely bit of play. Absolutely was. Um, so let's let's chat a wee bit about the Kilmarnock game then, I guess. But we'll stick on this this same theme. So mm-hmm. Roof... Uh, Kamar Roof and Cedric Itton made their full debuts from, from the start. Um, we'll talk about their performance in a wee bit, but but the manager himself mentioned post-match that we used Itton uh, as a right nine uh, rather than a wide ten, which yep. um, was interesting to, to hear. I don't think many people will have, have heard that um, terminology from a, a Rangers manager. Um, I know that the ten pieces kind of been overplayed a little bit in the last uh, 18 months or so, but that right nine um, isn't something many people have heard. So for me, this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this would be him basically looking to get the characteristics of a number nine, um, Mm -hmm. but playing him off the right-hand side. So um, just basically moving the role further over for a number of reasons, I guess. First of all, you would have Kamar Roof playing as the false nine, um, and yep. I've got I've got my hands up for for sweeps bubbles, but the, the false nine, um, and then you'd have it as the a number nine, but coming off the the right hand side. So basically doing his doing his role that he does anyway, but doing right. it from a from a different area of the pitch, right? Absolutely spot on, spot on. And I think this is the this is the nuances we're starting to see with the team now. Is um, you know, we're, you and I were copied a thread in Twitter, and a couple of boys are talking about. Um, the three five two, right? And obviously, that being something that Rangers could fit in nicely. If you look at this on a surface level, right? We'll, we'll draw this on the board here. Obviously, with Itton coming in, um, you know, Roof is a second forward. You've got uh, Kent coming inside. Obviously, you've got uh, Barker sort of working in the other channel. The two old mids, and then really, um, the two fullbacks getting forwards again. If we figured, I don't know, one of the mids dropping in. We're sort of there, right? You're, you're, you're sort of got that in attack, but then it morphs itself back into Tavernier drops, Barisic drops it and probably defends a little bit wider. You know, Kent goes back out, your midfield levels out and you're sort of back to your defensive shape again. So I think this is maybe where we're getting caught um, in the details a little bit as a fan base and that we want it to be cookie cutter of, this is the this is the formation that stays the same way. I don't think that's I don't even think that's modern football anyway. But I still don't think it's this manager or this coaching staff. So I think there's a flexibility there. But it goes back to the piece we've always spoken about, mate. It's, it's roles and responsibilities. Etten's role and responsibility was to get in an attack with Roof and make life for the centre backs hard. And it was his centre back on his side, which I want to say was broad foot on the left hand side. I might be wrong was to attack his shoulder. So it wasn't to run across the face like you would normally see a nine. It was to get round the back of him. So he had to turn his hips and look away for the ball. And when you've got three and four and five balls being pumped into the box consecutively over you know, a five, six minute period, that's hard to defend, right? Whereas if we roll it back a couple of months when we played them last and everything's in front of them, they can see the one striker, they can see the ball coming in and it's all nice and easy. I just think this is a, we bombarded them with balls in and runs 
that um, that just you know completely caused chaos for them. I thought it was interesting because I've I've said about Eton that I, I being physical in a Swiss a Swiss league to to being physical in Scotland is is a different kettle of fish. Right. Um. He obviously is a big boy. He's good in the air. He's strong. He's muscular. But I don't think his physicality is the main thing about him. Um. And I think we've we've said that before on, a, on um, I think I've said it on a couple of shows about him that I don't think he's going to be defined by his physicality first of all I think he's got a decent touch he seems to have a relatively decent turn of pace he'll um, his movement etc to get in at the front post and, and he crosses that up and I think that's how we'll see him so this was interesting to, to use him in a, in a different way um, and the manager said after the game we used him in that way because the, the Kelly left back is quite small in his words I think it's is it Callum right. Callum Waters the guy's name so right we used it in that sense, which which is one way I guess you could use it. But I guess other benefits of it would be if you didn't want him to go up against um, Stuart Finlay and, and Broadfoot for whatever reason. Uh, also, if he's a number nine, it's very easy for the centre halves just to ping vertical balls at him, right? Which which right. He's standing back to goal, they're standing facing the goal, they're going to get the run on him. Chances are they'll get the foul for backing in, given it's click Kevin Clancy, but that's for another uh, <laughs> another podcast. So it's it's just about giving the angle. Right, yeah, and absolutely. it also, and it means that he could he could possibly get a run on a centre half who's dealing with the ball squared on, but he's running from an angle to get him. The ball the balls are coming from Barisic, which was the target. So Barisic is pinging them on that diagonal to him, right on his head, essentially. Um, so there's a couple of benefits of it as as far as I can see, and I guess the most obvious comparison, if we if we go back again, is is how Walter Smith used to use Lee McCulloch. Which was basically balls yeah. pinged over from um, whoever it was. I think probably one of the centre halves, Bugera maybe. Balls pinged over to him for him to get his progresses up the pitch. Spot on, mate. And, and we'll, we'll draw that. We'll draw this out real quick here. So I think what was mentioned earlier was you've got um, the two centre backs of Kamara. Roof would occupy the ball side shoulder, right? So if, if Barisic is pinging a ball at the front post, we saw in his header, obviously just come off the post that in the start of the second half there. Um, obviously Etten's movement changed a little bit at the start of the second half but in the first half it was to again run the back shoulder so in theory now you've got again a Barker coming top of the box or Kent coming top of the box there's a gap, natural gap between the two so you're attacking both ends of the centre backs so again it's really it's just taking the eye line away for the ball you know they're both two experienced centre backs so the natural inclination for them is to drop and get closer to the goal which is ideal for us because now there's a separation between the midfield and their back line that maybe wouldn't have been there, you know, had this been Morelis playing up front himself that we mentioned there. So that run, I think that the manager was talking about, yes, it's to isolate the full back, but it's to essentially attack the space between the centre half and the full back and give us that back stick run that a two man striker system probably gives you. But again, like you said, his runs from deep. I think if we use build up playing the left correctly, we don't need him out there as a, as a right winger clearly because he's you know not needed. He's not involved in build up, and you then get the height of Tavernier coming up. Should a ball be cleared past him, that he, you know Tavernier can get out and redeliver a ball, which again we saw lots in the second half, which basically became you know a bit of a full backs being wide and a bit of a U shape like this right of ball movements from left to right. And who was going to have the shot and who was going to play the through pass? Really, right? I mean, that's certainly where the where the uh, the first goal came from, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess if we're if we're being honest, or if I'm being honest, um, I don't think it was. I don't think the the experiment, if you want to call it that, we're getting as the the wide nine was mega successful in the first half. I think it was interesting. You could see how it would work, but I, I wouldn't say he ran amok or anything or, or did huge amounts of damage with it but it was just interesting to see the variation I guess in the attack it could be a bit better but I guess it kind of goes without saying after the, the break like you mentioned um, Itton was a bit more in between the width of the, the goals right. if you like along with Roof yeah. and I think it, it, it worked a bit better but then I think it was just whole team approach um, I seen someone saying on Twitter that we had seven was it seven shots it couldn't have been seven shots on target. I don't know what it was, but it was a couple of a decent amount of shots on target in the opening five or six minutes of the, the second half. So clearly they got a rocket, which the manager again said that, that they would. And they came out tempo wise 
um, and went to get the goal, which they got. So I think there's an element of players taking ownership there, regardless of where you're playing on the pitch, um, taking ownership to, to be a bit more aggressive and a bit more, um, increase the tempo a bit more to, to get the goal. But I, I did think it worked a little bit better in the second half, but then it's always easier to play when you're a goal up, isn't it? Yeah, and I, again, the, the tweet positionally was, um, like you said, I think, altered things. Actually, you know, strangely, mate, to, to a shape we saw last week, right? You had Barker playing on an inside right, Kenton inside left, and then sort of roof on, right underneath it, right? They almost tried to separate that way. Um, but I also think as well, it's it's the unknown quantity, right? If these lads have never played against these two centre-backs, every run feels new, you know, the way you know you and I were speaking earlier, the way they pressed them, I thought they got after these centre-backs and really hit them hard. Um, I mean, it was obviously that nonsense booking um, that the Kilmarnock players made the clear- <laughs> clearance and somehow we managed to get a player booked. But I, I think if this is Morelis, I just think they defend differently because they've played each other, you know, 314 times last three seasons. So there's a familiarity there. Um, so again, I think just that freshness um, gave us a little edge, you know. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that's us. We've covered the number nine then in, in pretty great detail. Um, let's have a look at the the two wingers then. So for the purposes of this, it will be number eleven and, and number seven, which is left wing uh, and right winger. I right. instantly think of Brian Loudrop and Andre Kincelskis, which is a surprising one. I don't know why that he's he's the one that initially comes to my, comes to my mind, but he does. Um, so I guess you're thinking. 11 as a left winger and 7 as a right winger that, that kind of bears out a little bit um, that was the traditional as I, I say traditional um, as in 90s I would class as traditional so right. apologies for anybody that's uh, a lot older than, than us um, but that's what I would class as traditional wingers um, however the roles evolved quite a bit since then um, we covered how tactics evolved uh, and how most teams around the world switched to, to 4 2 3 one and I think it was one of the summer pods last season. Um, it feels like decades ago, but it's in the archives if anybody <laughs> fancies a look. Uh, it was a, a three-parter, 4-3-3, um, 4 3, three, four, two, three one, etc. Um, so go and take a look at that. But we covered that in detail, so we're not going to go through it. Everybody knows what a winger is, Ali, but what about mm. um, the variations that we see in the modern game? You mentioned some of the, the football manager uh, ones. There's a, a round a round doiter, which was basically just created for, for Thomas Muller, I think, uh, 10 years ago before everybody started doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But inside forward, I guess, is the, the obvious one, or, or an inverted winger? Yes, well, again, it's it's really just uh, the movements, right? So let's forget the ball for a minute, right? So the, the, the round doiter that you mentioned there is a direct movement inside off the wing, right? So, be, you know, much that we see Kent doing this of starting wide and then coming on the inside to open up the channel for your for your full back to advance forward, right? So again, when we talk about the days of Kinchelskis and Giggs, that didn't really happen, right? I mean, the full backs were defenders, right? They were part of the back four, and it was really the forward four um, that attacked, and then the two in between sort of did a bit of both, right? Now we've started to see a, a complete variation of what's the fullback's impact on the game. So this has now allowed, I think, a greater freedom of, you know, who you play there. Like Coutinho, um, you know, throughout his career, is is he a 10? Is he a wide player? Like, what really is he? I mean, you don't, no one, I guess, has really found the, the sweet spot. Willian's another example of a player that started as a, a number 10, more of a central player, and he's found his way out in the wing now because his ability to find space. So, again, if we figure the inside movements, then obviously we've got the regular on the outside, get to the end line, put crosses in. Kingsley Coman, again, another example. Yes, he's been altered to maybe play on the opposite side so he can cross with his right foot from the left. Um, but, you know, that, that team that, that um, Guardiola had in Germany, I mean, Costa would still get to the byline and put crosses in with their strongest foot. You know, they're still very much part of it. Again, I, I think, you know, looking at the board here, the relationship for me has to come from, is it the wide player that stretches play and the fullback attacks the inside or a midfielder attacks the inside channels? Or do we want the opposite? Do we want the wingers cutting inside to attack the central channels and your fullbacks attack the outside? We, you have to have two players on the outside now in, in modern football. Um, and again, I'm saying outside because I'm dividing it into two, one in, one out, not working on the same plane. So again, this idea that 
you know, I'm, I'm plucking two names at heart, right? But having a Cafu and a Kinchelskis, two guys that just hug the touchline, I think you kill yourself in transition now because there's now a massive gap between your midfield and your centre back and the outside that players, you know, teams can just split your pass in and your and your team shape's gone in transition. So I think there's yes, there's attacking roles to it and there's a how we want to attack piece. But like we've certainly saw with Gerard, it has to lend itself to well, how are we going to defend then when we lose the ball? Another again, not a quick example of that is Neymar in, uh, in last night's Champions League final. PSG have basically set up a system much in the way that Zidane did for Madrid when Ronaldo played in the left is we are now going to defend with one less player because we don't want him to, right? So how are we going to set our team up that allows him to basically be exclusively a winger, um, which is, you know, which is nice, I guess, if you got a player like that. Yeah, I, I guess the, the obvious, you mentioned Cafu and Kajelsk there, but I guess when, when we had Tav and Candias, that was the, the good example there on that side right. that One's a winger and one's a very, very offensive um, fullback. So great going forward, but they get hammered in transition because they're, they're both trying to attack. So that's a, a good example there. I guess the whole inverted winger piece came from that, that need to... I don't know what came first. The inverted winger who went for, for teams that wanted to dominate the middle and have that extra firepower with somebody coming in onto their, their weaker foot or the attacking fullback. But you can kind of see how the, the inside forward obviously leaves that space and comes into the central area and then the fullback overlaps past them. I can't quite remember what came first. I think it was probably the fullbacks, wasn't it? The fullbacks probably started getting a bit further forward and found that things were getting a bit crowded, so they moved inside forwards into the middle. I think there's that. I think there's also, again, culturally, we talk about how teams defend, right? In Spain, we see these crazy high lines, so the ball's in the right wing. We'll see the opposition shift the line up really, really high. Right, so in this you know instance, we've started to see left-footed right wingers, right that would that would create a ball into the back post. You know, we've then got a left winger attacking on the inside and making runs and scoring goals at the back post. So it's it's a way of getting past again these defensive lines or, or certainly what you're up against, um, or like we mentioned earlier, forwards that will run a channel and then put a cross in for the opposite side winger to attack the box and get goals. This is something we saw. He's in Dutch football for a long time is basically strikers playing as wingers because their their movement to attack the box was um you know was was better than a traditional winger would be. So I think the the inside movements of wide players I think has been born out of um you know how teams defend, but I think as well it's just an evolution of what we would once upon a time class as a winger. I think coaches have saw and how you know how can we use those players elsewhere. And it is getting blurred a little bit, isn't it? There's, there's a, it's very possible that a player can play false nine winger inside forward number ten in one right. game, really. Right, it, exactly. It's just, yeah. and that's what makes it so, so flexible, I guess, and why it's kind of blurred. Um, bring it back to the commandment game, then. Um, I think when most people, I got caught up in this a little bit myself. I'm not sure why, but most people thought it before four two, uh, when the team came out. And I guess that was probably because we had two strikers um, mm. and then essentially two wingers. I, I know neither of them are... Well, Barker probably is more of a traditional winger, but Kent hasn't been a winger um, for about 18 months. But it, it, you'll always call it... It's just lazy, and it? Ryan Kent, Rangers winger. Um, it's, it's just what people <laughs> people say. It. It's just a descriptive term. Um, but it kind of wasn't really like... Well, it wasn't like that at all for me. And it, right. it also wasn't... It also wasn't four three three, and it also wasn't four two three one. It was a kind of, it was kind of four four two. I thought, but maybe a wee bit of a diamond. Certainly in the first half, I thought Kent was, um, you had Davis at the base, if you like Jack being kind of slightly to the right, and then you maybe had Kent as a number eight almost for a for a little period of time. He was he was dropped quite deep. I thought on that left left half space, um, and then Barker was just a little bit ahead of him. They they kind of moved about quite a bit, I thought, the two of them. And as as the second half wore on, they maybe started to fall into more traditional, if you like, Rangers channels. But sure. I, certainly had the, I certainly had a feeling that Kent was a, an awful lot deeper, and I wonder if that was in part due to what we've been saying for a while about he's having to come so deep to get the ball. By the time he turns, there's nobody in front of him. So they've brought him a little bit deeper. 
um, in that game just to see what would happen. Like I said, I don't think it was massively noticeable, but it was, to me, it felt like his starting positions were a little bit deeper rather than him having to start further up and then come back to get the ball. That's fair. Yeah, I think they also um, probably got, I wouldn't say more space, right? But I think Kilmarnock defend in two banks, whereas I think Livingston were a bit more staggered in their press. Um, so their, let's say, right side of centre midfielder would sit off and almost protect the half space, as would their left, you know, and they'd almost sit with, you know, gaps in front of them to allow the player to receive the ball um, and deny the space in behind. Whereas Kilmarnock, I think, were a wee bit more aggressive in that they would try and get maybe a little bit higher. So that gave Kent and Barker a bit more space, 1v1, to try and dribble and get past people and maybe, you know, try and get in behind them or certainly if they stood in behind them. Um, you know, receive the ball in between the lines. I, I just thought both were really neat and tidy. You know, I thought that's probably as well as I've saw Barker play um, in, in league play anyway. And I think him and Kent complimented each other because we kept the ball and we kept it moving. Um, and I think the separation between Kamarnock's lines came from Roof and Itton being aggressive. So obviously that, you know, that stretched the space in between them. Um, but like you say, it's you, you're probably right by the way in periods it did look like a diamond. Um, again, I just think it's the invention and, and being creative in those moments, and ultimately oh, mate, not giving the thing away. Like that's that was a major difference for me. Yeah, I, I think it's it's like you said earlier on. Um, talking about the formation, whether it's four four two, four three three, is just a convenient way to illustrate what you think your point is. But right. really, what we're, what we're saying is, Kent dropped a little bit deeper. Barker was the only one kind of behind the two strikers. So however that kind of played out, we're not saying it was necessarily that formation for 90 minutes. Um, right. those various, and that's, I think, what the frustration is for the management is that they're obviously immersed in this and they can see that they have moved positions about quite a lot. They've done it quite a lot this season, but people will still say it's the same old, same old. This is happening, that's happening. We should go to 3-5-2, we should go to 4-3-3. And then they kind of gloss over the fact that you point out uh, but Aribo's played wide right, and then he's he's played number ten, and then we've had Aribo and Hadji, we've had it in the roof up top on the themselves, we've had Kent a little bit deeper, we've maybe had Jack, like people just kind of gloss over that a little bit, right. and they say oh, it's just the same thing, um, but it's maybe just because it's slightly too detailed for people who just want to go and watch the game and see Rangers win, they maybe miss that that nuance unless you're you're actually looking for it, I guess. Yeah, and and again, a lot of this. To be honest, you mate, as as the players' expressions, I, I when they when the management says we, we give them that, um, you know, express yourself that that age old phase. I think that's true. I, I generally do. I think a lot of these players like to have that freedom of movement within a certain portion of the field, right? So on the board here, we've obviously set up the three central channels. I do think Kent has freedom to move between, whereas you know Jack in the last game didn't really. They wanted him and Kamara to stay back. You saw lots of penetrative movements. You saw him getting in between the lines and getting high. So for sure, I think that that's the alteration. I think where they stand when the ball's moving just doesn't... It's not a thing on this team, right? There is movement. I think where we can be critical, though, and I think where it's fair to be critical is, well, that's all very well and good, um, having all these tactical plans, but if you aren't playing well, that that's the piece we're going to be critical of. I'm completely fine with that. Kent didn't play great last week. He was better than most people, but that's not saying much if you didn't win. I think in this game, I don't think it was that big a difference in his actual um, his numbers or his output or just his general play, but I think we got more from it. Right, so there's, there's that ability to look past individual performances and go, well, it's the tactics that's the reason for the individuals. I don't know, mate. I just think sometimes these guys haven't been playing well and our go-to is well, the tactics are wrong. Like, that's not that's not football, is it? You know, you can have a bad game. Yeah, I think absolutely. And it's funny you mentioned that. It just, it just reminded me of um, a win obviously glosses over so many things. Um, I watched the game and thought Barker looked quite good. He looked direct uh, and uh, he had a couple of shots, etc. But not too much else, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I watched it again and... Um, yesterday and you see how involved he is for the opening goal, um, shifting the ball over uh, for um, 
for Barisic and, and how he's kind of just maybe not doing very much in terms of output, but having a shot from forever, right. maybe low yeah. quality shots, but it doesn't really matter. He's direct, he's committing people, he's coming deep and he's taking the ball and he's trying to carry it. It wasn't scintillating, um, but I thought he was he was pretty pretty good. Um, I thought Kent was great on the on the day um, live. I thought he was brilliant, and when I watched it again, it was it was no different. He's been a lot more um, efficient, I think, with his his play and his runs, and he's he's obviously getting getting in the goals. Um, and he's getting what I like is he's getting goals from inside the posts. I think we said right. that about ten times on this uh, on this podcast already. But he's getting them from in there, which shows that he's kind of getting used to playing inside a little bit. But he's also moving vertically so there's two centre forwards playing but he's still up there getting chances that's what I like it's not really hitting hopes from outside the box or it's not really um, being slid in on the, the inside channel or anything it's pretty much getting yourself in a good position and, and scoring which is which is exactly what you want um, that point about performances um, as well was quite interesting because one of the one of the listeners tweeted me after the game saying it was a gif of a of a bear, I think it was, sitting waiting for his dinner. And it's like me waiting for me waiting for you to praise Ryan Jack's performance uh, on at the game. So it was right after the game, obviously I'm on Twitter, I'm firing out a lot of shite to be honest, and I'm thinking <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm thinking I don't really think he was that memorable. I don't really remember much in the way that I would be thinking, Oh my god, he was outstanding. Um but I did caveat that with I didn't really think anybody was outside of Kent. Um, right. And I watched it back and I, I kind of felt the same. But what I felt quite interesting was I didn't think he was any better or worse than he was last week against Livingston. I actually thought he was quite good against Livingston. I put out a wee visual and I thought he did his job well. But I think that's your point is that the player will play their role. It just depends what the team needs at that particular stage. So against Livingston, we needed something else. And it, it it's not... It's not his fault. It, it could have been we needed um, someone like Barker who turned up against Kilmarnock to come on and, and run and, and take somebody on, etc. And that would free up spaces, etc. He's playing his role. He's always a 7 out of 10. That's great. Um, the issue, I think, is when you try and turn him into essentially what Ryan Kent tried to do on Saturday and be that kind of attacking number eight. He's not going to do that. It's not his fault. It, it, it will just look laboured. So I find that quite interesting. You get a win and people think, oh, such and such was amazing. But then you compare it to the game before and he never actually did too much different. He was just he was good in both games. Right. But you can't kind of turn up in a, a draw at Livingston and say, I thought Ryan Jack was brilliant because people were like, you fucking joking me. We're doing now <laughs> now And he sat in front of the defence. But I think you need to give credit where it's due. But that's where I think we, we get a bit caught up on positions and expectations over just player performance yeah and and i think it's the predisposed um opinions piece i think that i'm struggling with just now i guess in all sorts on all levels of football really it's sort of it's a bit exhausting that um you know like you mentioned there ryan jack last week played two amazing balls into wide areas for tavernier and barisic right lovely clip pass if Barisic crosses that and somebody scores, it's what an inspired pass, right? But neither attack really came to anything. Well, that doesn't change what he's done, right? He's, st- he's still done the right thing in that moment. Uh, my biggest frustration, a lot of the, a lot of the things certainly that Jack is doing, is that he's well not playing to his strengths. We're asking him to do things he's not good at. So in this game, when he gets further forward, makes those driving runs, can help his press higher up the field. I think you 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 set him up for success more. Um, but like you said, if that then couples with a win, that doesn't instantly increase his, you know, his output to be, oh, he was amazing today. He could just be steady and, and just be a, a nice player. I think the way the team plays, it's going to be a team effort all the time. I don't I don't see this being a, OK, give the ball to this player. Um, and you could even label that when, when Morelos is in the team. I don't, I don't think it was really that. He certainly got in the end of a lot of things, but it wasn't always a Morelis, you know, inspired performance in the way that maybe an Edward is for Celtic or, you know, other other big players are at other big clubs. Like, I think this is very much a team effort. Um, and that's that's not a bad thing, right? No, nah, not at all. Um, I'm conscious of time, but we'll, we'll briefly talk about the defence. I'm not sure there's much we can do about um, player roles, etc., that we could do next week, for example, on defence. I think we, we've spoken about the fullbacks in great detail over the last 
couple of years. We know what they do. The centre backs at the minute are are good, um, but they've just got their their roles. We could talk about ball playing defenders, etc. But I think we we all kind of know what that that entails. There's not as much variation in the defensive. Uh, four as there maybe is in the, the midfield of the attack so we probably won't do a full show on it um, but a wee word for the defence I guess Ali in terms of their performance uh, we were speaking off air and, and I said it doesn't it feels like teams aren't going to get a spell in the games now um, probably January to March there was always that if Rangers were 0-0 or 1-0 you could see teams kind of gaining confidence and then they'd come out um, there was I don't know how many games we went 1-0 up held on for some bizarre reason um, and started defending and then teams came out at us and, and eventually managed to get to get a goal um, or two. It doesn't really feel like it this season, but like you said off air, it, teams would actually have to come out and attack us um, <laughs> yeah. for that to happen. There's only been seven shots on target uh, in these five games against us, so seven times basically McLaughlin or McGregor's had to make a save. Um, there's been some again that's quite a, a vague start there's been some good defending Hellander's got back and made a, a couple of really good clearances um, Golson has been outstanding um, for, for the start of the season as well so I guess we need to give him a little bit of praise there and it could be chicken and egg it could be they're doing really really well and we're snuffing out the chances or it could be on the opposite side I guess that teams haven't quite decided that they want to come out and have a go at us yet Yeah I think just probably somewhere in the middle right I mean the other I guess the other thing you got to look at is how prepared were a lot of these teams coming into the league physically um, compared to us. And I think our preseason was, you know, as good as anyone's, right? I mean, we were, we appear to be um, a decent bit in front, fitness-wise. I think the way we've pressed from the front this year, um, obviously starting more narrow, so you're going to get more pressure on the ball. You, you delay more attacks. Chris, if you go back to the... the the sort of murky Kashinia era where Christ it's like knife through butter through the Rangers team. That's certainly not the case anymore. Um I think we're very more you know, a lot more forceful in the middle of winning challenges. So I think well the back line itself has been very good defensively. The protection they get second to none. I mean they're just numerically the amount of guys in front of them's is uh, is very strong, you know, so there there's there's definitely that mindset. Um, and I think as well, the more this is going, the more it's a thing, um, it just becomes, you know, part of the psyche of playing against Rangers. You know, like it's a good thing to have these stats. But I think if you compare it to the last few seasons, I think we've always started the season well. Um, we've always started with, you know, decent runs of clean sheets, albeit friendlies and all that stuff. Um, like you said, it's, it's in that January, February time. Can we maintain it? And that's going to be the big test for this team, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. I mentioned seven shots, seven shots on target against, but we've only actually let teams take seventeen shots at our goal um, in those five games. So getting on target is one thing, but literally seventeen shots at the goal that would class as seven on target, ten off target. Obviously, for those of you that don't know how to do maths, um, Celtic interestingly have played obviously two games fewer. Um, and they've already faced 19 shots at goal, so it doesn't really mean anything by by way of comparison. But I guess it's a good, decent benchmark for Rangers that there are so many chances um, that we're managing to restrict, which is good. If we look at the expected goals against, then we'll probably start to bring these back into the the pods um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but if we look at expected goals against, it's 1.7 at the minute, which is um, the Aberdeen. Stramash, I think it was, um, and then Levy had a, a decent chance. I think um, it was a shot from I can't remember the boy's name uh, against Livingston, but that pretty much was it that made up the the most of that one point seven. So um, you could argue that by the letter of the law, we should have conceded almost two goals at this point. But when you think of those two chances, they weren't really ones that outside of that Stramash that could go anywhere. But it's not really as if we've been cut open at any point and, and had a, a point blank saver in to make it's just been a pretty well rounded um display by the, the back five. Yeah, I mean this this is, you know, they always talk about the the chance for sustaining it. Defensive stats are always hard to sustain because Christ the goal could get off somebody's backside, right? There's no there's no major signs to it. But I think if we look at this in terms of probability, if we keep going with this form, um it gives us a great platform. And if the lads can still 
keep banging around the other end. Again, all paints a very good picture, right? Absolutely. And just before just before we finish, then a wee word for Neil McCann, Ali. We were quite chuffed that he uh, yeah. first of all did some tactical analysis on Rangers TV, which I thought was was really good to see. But also that he pretty much said everything that that we say, which is a uh, which is quite good. It sounds like we're on the right track. <laughs> exactly. He's a, he must be a subscriber, mate. That's what it is. It must be. If he wants to get us on the show, we're more than happy to, <laughs> more than happy to bring tactical pad to the to the, the globe. Right. Um, okay, Ali, that will do us for tonight then. Thank you very much for joining me. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you. And once again, thank you for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. And if anybody, not just chief, expre- uh, chief executive subscribers, if anybody has any questions or topics they want us to cover in, in future shows, then please let us know in the comments. Cheers. This is a Heart and Hand production.